Okay, well, hello and welcome everyone to this IFG event on improving the UK's energy efficiency held in partnership with the Buildings Research Establishment. Uh, my name's Tom Sass, I'm an Associate Director here at IFG and I lead our work on net zero. So energy efficiency has long been a Cinderella area for UK uh, policymakers. We're all very aware at the end of this somewhat cold winter that the UK's housing stock is among the oldest and draftiest in Europe. And successive governments have struggled to design policies that will boost insulation uh, with well-explored problems in terms of low consumer awareness uh, and the lack of a skilled workforce to deliver upgrades. We're also grappling with the, the linked problem of low carbon heat. So how to replace gas boilers that are in the vast majority of homes right across the country and ensure that we have the infrastructure necessary to switch to low carbon heating solutions. Energy demand and energy efficiency were curiously absent from the government's initial response to this uh, energy crisis. So if you go back to the British energy security strategy, there wasn't much in there. But in recent months, we've seen an increasing uh, focus on them, in particular with the Chancellor announcing a new target uh, on re reducing energy use in homes by 2030, announcing new funding uh, and the creation of a new task force. We've also seen a public information campaign. And in the background, we, of course, have ongoing Eco and Eco Plus schemes, as well as a new boiler upgrade scheme. So how much progress is the government making? What barriers do we face in scaling up energy efficiency and low carbon heat across the country? Uh, and what will central and local government need to do to overcome them? I've got a brilliant panel to cover all of that, all of whom are, are experts in this area. So on my right, uh, Philip Dunn, MP, Chair of the Environmental Audit Committee, which has done several inquiries into this topic. Then have Kerry McCarthy, Shadow Minister for Climate Change, who's been helping to shape Labour's approach to this question, which of course is forming a big part of their pitch to voters. We then have Gillian Charlesworth, Chief Executive of the Buildings Research Establishment, uh, which has also published several reports as well as some really interesting cost analysis on these questions. And finally, Andrew Sissons, Deputy Director for the Sustainable Future Mission at Nesta, uh, which again is doing some really interesting work on heat pumps and, and rolling those out. So how this is going to work, I'm going to ask some opening questions of my panel. We're then going to have at least 20 or 25 minutes for questions from you. Uh, those online, I can see you're already sending those in on Slido. That's excellent. Those in the rooms can just put your hands up. Uh, we'll be tweeting the event from the IFG events account. And you can also tweet if you uh, feel uh, the need to uh, using the hashtag IFG Energy. So with that, uh, Philip, I'll come to you first. How would you assess the government's progress on improving energy efficiency? Thank you, Tom. Well, as the Environmental Audit Committee is the main scrutiny body in, uh, in Parliament, we have done, uh, on environmental matters, um, we've done quite a lot of work, as you said, in looking at this subject. Um, you, raised, you said in your opening remarks that there's been a lack of consumer awareness of the challenge of, uh, our, of, of heating our homes. I think uh, there is now very hi much heightened consumer awareness because of the consequences of... Putin's invasion of Ukraine and the uh, escalating energy costs and the steps that the government has taken uh, recognising that this was imposing intolerable burdens on households across the country. I think people are now acutely aware of uh, the cost of heating uh, and, and what they can do to mitigate that. In fact, uh, the, the extremes of this were illustrated to me uh, by a constituent the other day who got in touch to say that they have it's an elderly couple living in a bungalow. Uh, they have been wearing woolly jumpers and sitting during the day wrapped in blankets to avoid turning on their heating. And the, they've been so successful at this that they can't currently qualify for the £200 alternative fuel payment because they haven't spent £200 on their heating. And, and until we pointed this out to the government, you haven't been able to claim if you were spending less than £200. So I think the government's going to address that. Um, but, but it rather brought home you know, the reality that is out there at the moment as a result of this extraordinary period that we've just been in. 
You also touched on some measures that the government have taken recently to um, raise the profile of this issue across government, and I think you're absolutely right to do so. So I, I think it'd be fair to say, if you go back to 2010, that there was quite a lot of good work done in the first period of the coalition government, we, we, but it was mostly trying to pluck the low-hanging fruit. Mm. So if you listen to a government minister today, they will talk in terms of uh, from 2010 when about 10% of dwellings were uh, achieving EPCC standard, and they would say that today it's about 46%. That's quite a lot more than the figure we were looking at two years ago. Mm. Um, so there has been a significant improvement, but much of it was done installing loft, loft insulation, uh, draft excluders around windows and doors, that kind of thing, which is both cheap and quite effective. Mm. Um, it achieved over, I think the peak in 2012, was about two million properties during that year mm. were improved that figure has come plummeting down as we get into the harder to deal with retrofit mm. um, properties. The government targets were, which were, they introduced to try to um, uh, uh, deal with retrofit were based on advice from uh, the Committee on Climate Change, which had estimated that the average cost of retrofitting a property to get to EPCC was seven and a half thousand pounds. Now, admittedly, they did this a few years ago, but when we looked at this two years ago, we had very uh, good evidence from housing associations, uh, the, the Northern Housing Consortium you'll be familiar with, which, uh, and Leeds City Council, who had over 300,000 properties that they had assessed in their area. And they both came up with a similar figure, which was just under 20,000 pounds of property for an average three bedroom. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, terraced house uh, before you install a heat pump and a heat pump at the time was costing on average about £9,000 it's now costing over £10,000 much over £10,000 um, the cost being brought down by the boiler upgrade scheme to make it more affordable but, but anyway you cut it that's going to be sort of 20, 20 to £30,000 call it £25,000 mm. which is a very significant um, amount of money for individual householders, uh, owner occupiers, um, and it's also an increasingly disruptive process because uh, for the harder to, to retrofit properties, I'm sure we'll get onto this, uh, you can really only do it when there's a change in tenure or occupant mm. because it's so disruptive. The idea that you can move room by room around a house, uh, creating uh, effectively a complete redecoration of the, of the room because that's often what is required um, is very difficult w while you're living in the house. So I think there are a lot of challenges. I think the government is now get, beginning to get to grips with it, having had a hiatus uh, in recent years. The appointment of the Energy Efficiency Task Force by the Chancellor last autumn I think is very significant. You mentioned the new target, which is to reduce energy demand by 15% from buildings uh, by 2030 against the 2020 or 21 uh, baseline, I think is is, is very important and it's led to an additional allocation of £6 billion of funding from 25 to 28. We don't yet know how that's going to be spent. I think part of the role of the task force will be to devise, devise schemes to enable that to be deployed. So I think the government is, is, doing, uh, is apprised of the challenge and is doing better, but it, I think it'd be fair to say it's had a rather, rather shaky start. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Philip. And, and just on the consumer awareness, because I think you're absolutely right to point out that, and that sort of powerful example you offered, that people are much more aware of their, their energy bills and have had to think about it an awful lot more in the last sort of year, year and a half. Um, you also mentioned, as you say, that we're moving on to the much more difficult stuff, cavity wall insulation. Do you think people are aware of what it is they might need to do to their homes in order to get to where they need to get to and the steps that they need to take to get there? Because it's one thing to be aware of, you know, just how much your energy bill is increasing, but actually, how do I do something about this when you sort of receive letters from your constituents? So, so if you look at the different types of tenure, I think social housing providers are very aware. 
they're very experienced. Most of the funding that has come uh, under the government has been into social housing uh, specific, sort of groups of projects, local authorities, social housing providers have been able to bid in for uh, improving uh, uh, blocks of houses. Um, and so they have a, a very good handle on what's involved. I suspect that tenants, the residents, have virtually no idea of what's involved. Um, and as you go sort of up the ownership chain, owner-occupiers, I think the level of awareness is incredibly mixed. Mm. You've got, as in everything uh, in, in environmental, there are the uh, advocates, the zealots, the enthusiasts, who've probably already done pretty much everything they can do to their property, possible exception, not yet got the heat pump installed. Mm. Um, and they are extremely aware, and, then, and that ranges down to people who, who don't know what's involved and first, certainly don't know what it's going to cost and don't really have any idea of the disruption. Uh, and disruption is uh, it's quite significant because you're, you, if you're talking about requiring um, uh, internal uh, insulation, then you're, you're having to add 75 mil of insulation mm -hmm plasterboard in front of it, that's redecoration, you've got to change all the electric sockets, you've got to change the window sills, if you're, going to sh if you're putting double glazing into your windows, uh, that's all the windows in the, in the house. Um, that is a, a full redecoration, mm. it's not a light matter, which is why I say it really only makes sense to do this when there's a change of occupant. Mm. And, and at that point, you know, I think what will, what's going to, one of the things that will trigger behavioural change is when the banks start offering uh, preferential mortgages to people who've got um, the intent, if it's not already an EPCC or above property, but the intent to get there, um, the, the banks have made commitments, the mortgage lenders, to uh, rebalance their mortgage books so that they are increasingly um, green. So they, um, and that that is going to lead them to provide, if they want to achieve that ambition, um, mortgages which are encouraging people to, to make their homes energy efficient. Uh, and that leads to the prospect of you know, much greater awareness at the time of seeking a mortgage. Mm. Uh, everybody now has to know what their EPC rating is before they buy a property or, or rent a property. Um, and I think we will see pressure <coughs> from mortgage providers uh, as well as government for, for, for those to, for people to, to do the work that's required. That's really useful. Thank you. Kerry, um, how would a Labour government be approaching this, this problem of energy efficiency and uh, low carbon heat? And if you want to offer your assessment to go alongside <laughs> Philip yeah, of, yeah. of the government's performance, you can, you can do that too. Well, just very briefly on that, we know that at current rates it would take 92 years to actually retrofit all the, the homes that, that need it, will bring up to the standard that um, uh, we want to see. Uh, over the last, well, between, in 2022, the number of homes being retrofitted halved um, compared to the previous year, and the House of Lords was just going to report on the boiler upgrade scheme saying take-up's disappointingly low. I mean, that's a small pot of money, but um, I think only two-thirds of it has been allocated. So there are real concerns about the way that it's rolling out. Um, in terms of what Labour would do, we I hope you'll have heard of our Green Prosperity Plan, which is this £28 billion a year for capital investment um, in, in the green economy. As part of that, we have allocated £6 billion a year over 10 years. So that would be starting 2025, we're assuming, um, probably in autumn 2024 election. So decade from 2025, um, £6 billion a year with the aim of retrofitting 19 million homes, bringing them up to EPCC standard. I would say that actually one of the other things is we have seen well over a million homes built that don't in the last sort of seven years or so since the zero carbon home standard was dropped that don't meet EPCC standard, which, you know, that's, that's ludicrous given the scale of having uh, the challenge for retrofitting homes um, that we are still building homes that don't meet that standard. In terms of how we would deliver, I mean, the, the calculation is that this would help create about 200,000 jobs, full-time equivalent jobs in the first year or so, and then there'd be many other jobs in the supply chain. Um, it would also save people about £1,000 a year on their um, energy bills. The challenges that we've got are, um, well, the start one of them is, is skills. 
um, particularly in an industry where a lot of the people that would be involved in doing this work are um, very small, you know, uh, one or two, uh, I'm trying to avoid saying white van man, but you know, you know what I mean, people that are subcontracted, rather than it being, um, you know, one big company that would help lead that charge and recruit people in the supply chain. That's a real issue. I don't see much evidence that the green jobs, the government had the green jobs task force, which people who are involved in it, told me was actually quite a positive experience. But now there's the Green Jobs Delivery Group, and I'm trying to sort of find out what that actually means in, in terms of um, helping uh, train people up to, to deliver this sort of work. And there doesn't seem to be much coming out of that at the moment. Um, we're obviously very conscious of the fact that if we get into government, we want to hit the ground running. So we want the government to sort of start doing this work on skills now. Um, the lack of certainty is just something that comes up in all the conversations I have with um, people in the sector, whether it's the housing associations, financial institutions, um, people like the Master Builders, National Housing Federation. Because if you look back at the history of this, like say with the warm home grants, there's been lots of stop-start schemes. Consumer confidence is very low, particularly people who dipped their toes in the water. There were quite a lot of cowboy operators. There were projects that were not completed and there was also sort of stop start between the eco scheme so people who did move into that sector with a, there was a pot of government money to fund that work and then it might have stopped for a year or 18 months well that's 18 months in which they haven't got any income stream and, and businesses went under as a result of that so you've absolutely got that's why we've made this clear pledge for 10 years because you've absolutely got to give people the, the knowledge that this is the direction of travel this is happening people have to sort of get with the program so to speak and if you if you compare it to say what's happened with electric vehicles there were very clear signals there you know the ban on the sale of new ICE vehicles from 2030 you've got the ZEV mandate coming in um, there's some mixed signals on other things like removing the plug-in grant but at least the industry knew where things were going and we need that equivalent certainty um, on on this um, and in terms of cons consumers um, I think you know it is a massive upheaval for people, and um, I was I met a company the other day that had come up with an app they've got funded from Innovate UK that would demonstrate to people exactly what the impact would be on their homes, and almost like they could choose which bits they wanted done and so on. But the way um, we see it rolling out would be on a street by street basis. So rather than picking and choosing individual properties, you would it, it's just far easier to deliver it en masse. But that means you do have to get people in the street to all sign up and there'll be mixed tenure and so on. Um, local authorities have a big role to play in trying to choose the best areas. Um, and I think uh, the final thing I'd say, we are very conscious that, you know, there's low hanging fruit. There, there, there's houses that wouldn't cost a huge amount to do. I think we're looking at maybe like 35,000 or so. The figure seems to be mentioned a lot. But there are others where it would be far more difficult. But let's start with the ones where you can demonstrate that this can happen at a critical scale. You can then get people that are choosing to do this um, uh, as, as they're living and, and then get on to the more complicated ones afterwards. Brilliant, thank you. And you, you clearly got there, you know, more consistent long-term funding and a potentially a, yeah. a sort of bigger pot of money. One aspect, I, I wonder, have you started to sort of think through the role of local authorities in this more? Because we've seen some interesting developments on that. I think this week, actually, we're going to see some new Devo deals announced, which yeah. potentially give uh, Manchester and the West Midlands sort of much clearer long-term sort of visibility over their, mm. their funding and allows them potentially to do some of that um, sort of long-term stability type work that you're talking about. I mean, have you, do you see yeah. a different role for local areas in, in driving this particular policy area as an important part of your plans? Yeah, we do, although... Um there was a lot of interest in this topic at Labour Conference. I think I must have done about seven roundtables or fringe events. And I know there was one when I mentioned something about local government being the, the vehicle for delivering this. Um, the councils in the room all rolled their eyes. <laughs> and it was like another thing that we're being asked to do without the resources. So obviously the resources would, would have to follow. And, you know, there's a degree of expertise needed to be able to assess, you know, where, where you would start the programme and so on. So... Um, People have also put forward the proposal there needs to be like a national delivery unit mm. and then working with the local authorities. But, um, but yeah, we would, we would it, it just makes sense that it would be local authorities that would coordinate it at a local level. Brilliant, thank you. Um, 
Gillian, um, what does industry need from government in order to get on with delivering these changes? Yes, thank you. Well, I endorse um, quite a lot of the, the things that Kerry said in response to this. Um, and I think that the first thing is a recognition that far more money, I'm afraid, and a lot more regulatory intervention is going to be needed. Um, what we have at the moment is not going to get us to net zero. I think that's, that's abundantly clear. But I think there's another recognition that's needed, which is this isn't all about cost and problems. It's actually a big opportunity. Um, we've done quite a bit of research into the cost of poor housing, which some of you may have seen. Uh, and one of our headline numbers is that we could, the NHS could save 540 million pounds a year if we were to get stuck into the task of um, tackling poor, poor quality homes. Um, and that has multiple benefits, of course, savings to the NHS, decarbonising, but also getting people back to work. There's abundant evidence that uh, people in those poor homes are struggling to, to work, uh, uh, another big issue that we need to tackle. So lots of opportunity, um, other uh, challenges have been cited, but I really think there's, there's absolutely no choice. We have to get stuck into the retrofit challenge if we're going to achieve our, our targets. I think that I just want to amplify what, what's been said already about um, joined up policy. Um, uh, I've talked to a lot of people in the industry, of course, and I think there is a growing recognition that there are too many initiatives, uh, too many different standards, different requirements, uh, and that's just from the industry side. The industry is very keen to, in many ways, to, to get involved and to do what's right, but because of a lack of um, regulatory legislative requirements, there, there are so many initiatives coming out, all competing for space, uh, a lot of energy and effort is expended on setting them up uh, and funding them. If only we could join up more with the umbrella of, of a government strategy around standards uh, and regulations, I think that would be very helpful indeed. And I think there is growing uh, appetite in industry for that. And it links, of course, to the point about consistent policy and certainty, which I absolutely endorse. Um, already talked about skills and education. Another piece of research that we've done recently on public awareness about heat pumps, for instance, shows that 62% of the public really have no clue about heat pump technology, don't know how it works. And actually, very anecdotal, but I'm sure we've all talked to people who've either had a heat pump or have got a friend who have had a heat pump fix, fitted. Uh, and there's still you know, a lot of confusion and quite a bit of disappointment because um, the, the fitting or the, the, the arrangements or the absolutely required insulation to make the heat pump work properly has not been, uh, has not been installed. So I'm afraid we're taking backward steps in terms of public understanding and confidence in the technology. Mm. There's one more very specific thing that I just want to throw in. Um, this, is quite, this is quite a detailed point, but it's a very important one. Um, as part of the Brexit transition, the government is requiring us to uh, adopt UK CA marking for construction products. The requirement for those will come in in 2025. It's already been put off two or three times because the industry is not ready to provide the testing and certification required to give a UKCA mark to every new product coming on the market. Um, it might sound outlandish, but the uh, bodies, the very few bodies who test radiators, for instance, bearing in mind that we're going to need many more bigger radiators, um, is citing 80 years to get through all the testing required. So we really need some form of mutual recognition or some form of grandfathering uh, for those sorts of schemes 
to make sure that we've got the, the, the equipment and the product that we can actually fit into homes mm. to, uh, to, to fulfil the retrofit strategy. That's an important point. Just on your point about joined up policy making, so we're obviously talking here about two transitions alongside each other really, about insulating homes and yeah. about changing the, the heat uh, technology. Yeah. And I think there's often quite a lot of discussion about, oh well of course you know, heat pumps won't work very well in a poorly insulated home, but, but not, perhaps not a really detailed understanding of exactly where we need to get our homes to in order for heat pumps to be effective enough and, and, and what that joined up policy making looks like. I mean, do you think that we have enough clarity about that in, when we're discussing this? Well, I think, I think there's, there's a, you know, clearly there's an aim for us, for us all uh, to get our um, energy e efficiency up to the highest possible level. Uh, putting, stepping up to C is a, is a step in the right direction, but it's not actually going to, to get us where we need to. So I think that um, there's probably over-reliance on new technology, new ideas coming forward. Uh, actually, what we've got already uh, is going to achieve a lot if we had the right expertise to install it properly, with the right advice by the people who are actually on the ground providing um, the services. Uh, and at the moment, I would say the answer is no, we're not, we're not ready. Consumers aren't ready to know what they're getting. There's a lot of people in the industry on the front line who aren't ready to install with the right level of expertise. So, sadly, another gap in the, in the, prop, in the, uh, the scenario that we're facing. But, you know, one that can be, clearly can be solved with the right training and education. Andrew, um, what do you think is needed to scale up this, uh, or sort of speed up this transition on both low carbon heat and retrofit? So, <laughs> it's a huge question, and um, there are many barriers and many things that get in the way. I just want to frame a couple of things in this debate. So energy efficiency, people often jump to one bit, so often they jump to insulation, which is part of energy efficiency. But energy efficiency is partly about how sort of the fabric of your home, but it's also partly about your heating system and also crucially how you use it. So different boilers and heat pumps and things have different levels of efficiency. And the things people do with their heating system are really important in terms of how um, how much how big their energy bills are. And actually that's the bit that's hardest to control and the bit that probably gets the least focus and is, is really important. And there's also two kind of goals in this, in this policy area, which I think um, we, we tend to conflate. One is the fuel poverty and health point, the point that Gillian talked about, about low quality housing. And that's a really acute problem, but it doesn't affect the whole population. It's something that, um, as Philip outlined, is really acute. But in, and, it, and it is generally very pervasive in things like the private rented sector, but it's not something that applies to everybody. And I personally think we have to be really careful not to throw huge amounts of public money at people who can, for example, afford um, you know, large heating bills, things like swimming pools and so on, because there, there, is a, there, is a, there is a reality that we're not talking about everybody. We're talking, in terms of the fuel poverty side, we're talking about a subset of people that we should be able to be, get better at helping um, and, and tackling some of the awful stories we've heard over this winter and for many winters before. Um, but the second bit of it is the decarbonisation. And decarbonisation actually looks quite different to the tackling fuel poverty thing for a few reasons that I probably won't have time to go through all of it. But the insulation part, the sort of fabric of the homes, actually makes a relatively minor contribution to decarbonisation. So the key thing, if you want to decarbonise home heating, which we have to do, because it is 14% of um, our carbon emissions, it's one of the biggest chunks, and it will not, it is not stubbornly not going down. The, the key thing there is, is swapping out boilers. That is by far and away the biggest impact. I think on the Climate Change Committee's estimates, insulation does about 8% of the work on decarbonising emissions from buildings. Um, that does include commercial premises, but it, it's quite a small um, piece. And I think one of the challenges with insulation, Philip alluded to this, if you, if you take the, well, the, the estimates I've seen most recently are about 250 billion pounds across the UK to get to EPCC in every home. 250 billion pounds, if we take that to the Chancellor, whether it's a Labour or a Conservative or any other party's Chancellor, that's a pretty steep bill now. It's not all public money, but that is, just to give a context of scale there, um, I've run some numbers on this and it's quite similar to the amount as a society we invested in building the railways in the Victorian era in terms of the share of our national income. It's kind of comparable to that level of input. And it's not the only thing we need to do. It's one, only one small part of what we need to do on NSO. And you may remember from the railway mania, lots of people, lots of private investors lost, lost a lot of money um, 
on that. So there is a real challenge about we can call for more money, but there are, there are huge demands for money. And it's not just the government spending money, it's people. And ultimately, if you're asking people to spend £10,000 or more, particularly owner-occupiers, if you're asking people to spend that amount of money, the payoff has to be really good. And I think that's something we have struggled with. Is I don't think, um, it's, it's, this is true of low-carbon heating and it's true of insulation at the moment, is I don't think people like it enough to spend that money on it. So I think we have to be, so my, my sort of take on the, on the overall debate is we have to be laser focused on fuel poverty and on health and make sure there is public money channel there to tackle those really acute problems. But we need to be much more circumspect about where you want to spend and people spend their money mm. on the whole system. And if, if, you, if you're going after net zero, ultimately you probably need to put a bit more into the, the heat source. So that is mainly replacing oil and gas boilers with heat pumps or heat networks or things which don't emit carbon to start with. Um, in terms of the challenges, just to sort of, to scaling up the sector, I'll focus a bit more on heat pumps because that is the, the sort of key net zero bit in this bit I know. There, there are several different challenges, but the, 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 the three I guess I would start with, I would sort of draw attention to. Number one is the cost of electricity. And this sounds ridiculous, but we're, we're this net zero transition we're in we're going to need to use uh, two to three times more electricity than we currently do. Everything in net zero is about electrification in the next decade. Electric vehicles use loads of electricity. Industry electrifying uses lots of electricity, heat pumps. And in the UK, we have very expensive electricity and quite cheap gas. We, well, we have, until recently, have quite cheap gas. And when the gas price rises, the electricity price rises with it. And we have this prop. That means that if you want to get someone to switch to a heat pump, they cost loads to run. Even though a heat pump uses three or four times less energy per unit of heat than a gas boiler, you still pay about the same or more because we have such expensive electricity. In the UK, the, the, the ratio of um, electricity to gas prices, which is the absolute key, the golden number, if you're in a business in this sort of electri electrification space, that, that ratio is crucial. It's currently at the lowest it's been for about a decade at 3.3 in the UK it's probably going to go up towards four or five where it was before the crisis. Now, in France, that ratio is 1.7. Uh, and that, it's, it's technical numbers, but that means in France and in many of the European countries, switching to electric technologies, A, is really attractive, and people are doing it. That's why the rest of Europe and parts of America are seeing a very fast transition to heat pumps. But also, um, it's, it means that you can reduce fuel bills. If you have cheap electricity, um, you can actually make a lot of the, the issues we're talking about go away. So cheap electricity would be my number one thing. Mm. Very briefly, the other two things that really matter, one is, is phase updates. So we know from electric vehicles, um, you've got to have a clear line to say, you cannot use, you cannot install a new gas boiler or oil boiler after this date, and you have to stick to it. We've seen how well that works for electric vehicles. That is crucial, but that requires the government to pick a date and stick to it. Mm. And just finally, it's the signals to the industry. You have a lot of people who have... Um, uh, currently install gas boilers, um, or, or a lot of them sole traders, um, or people who might invest in this industry, and you just need to give them that signal that this is, this is where the future is, this is where this is going, mm. and not um, shift, shift around. And, and that, that kind of commitment to clear policy, set a date, commit to get electricity cheaper, um, and put in place some of the things Julian's described, and you will, have, you will have people piling in money, because there are loads of investors, to Philip's point about banks, who are desperate to invest a lot of money in this world, but they can't because they just aren't certain that, that, that the rug won't be pulled from, from under them. Brilliant. Thank you, Andrew. Just before I open that up to questions from the room, uh, I wanted to pause for a moment on energy performance certificates, EPCs, <laughs> because brought up already in the discussion, we've had questions coming in from online. You know, we're using these as a sort of, you know, big part of our policy yeah. sort of toolkit for setting targets, for looking at who's, who can qualify for support. But actually, they're quite inaccurate in lots of different ways. We've seen lots of stories of people installing a heat pump and they go down from C to, to D. Okay. Um, uh, Julie, uh, Kerry mentioned actually sort of energy audits and some of the things that are happening in, in terms of what businesses are offering. But what do you think we can do there? Because actually, it's, it's quite difficult for us to think about how we're going to drive progress in the way you mentioned without getting a bit better at being able to measure what's happening. So EPCs are a really big topic. It's a really big problem. We are basing potentially hundreds of billions of pounds on spending on a measure that I think a lot of the industry is sceptical of, and EPCs, it's not as simple as just, oh, fix them, and the government has had a plan to fix them for a while. This is a complicated thing. I think fundamentally there are, there are two um, issues. One is that EPCs do about four different things, and the bit you get on, that you, you know, if you put into Rightmove or Zoopla or any such site, the bit you get is the energy use, the energy consumption, or kind of an estimate of your energy bill. 
and there's a load of other um, issues around fabric that get blurred. But because it's trying to do four different things, you get this really weird methodology that churns out some strange results. So I think, I think being clear what EPCs are for mm. would be the first thing, and then just having something slightly simpler that focuses on that. And I think probably it is energy use um, is the key thing. So trying to, you know, if, if the aim of the, the certificate is to reduce people's energy use, and that would then mean that if they have more efficient heating devices like heat pumps, they won't that there's this problem of installing a heat pump and seeing your EPC get worse, which is because of this blurring of directions. But I think the other thing is, is we just need to gather some data from people's homes. Um, ultimately, we, we do this thing by kind of like, you know, an EPC assessment is someone goes and scans the home. They just look and see. And what we don't do is measure. We have smart meters in half of homes. We should be able to just measure what is the energy performance here and try to fix those issues and try to, try to match it. And if we want to take a more individualized approach to homes, we're going to have to start gathering data on, on how those homes actually perform and how people, crucially, how humans um, behave within those homes. Mm. Philip, you want to come in? Maybe just, a... just very briefly. I think Andrew's absolutely right to raise this whole issue of electricity pricing versus gas pricing. Mm. I think we're getting to the point where we've got to change fundamentally the basis on which we, uh, we charge for electricity. So the consequence of the, I think it's called the non-community cost, uh, additional charge onto consumers' bills, uh, this summer is going to get to more or less parity with the actual cost of the electricity. So, i.e., 50% of your bill will be for electricity and 50% of it will be the charges for things like contracts for difference, uh, the, the cost of that coming onto consumers' electricity bills. Uh, and that seems to me to be unsustainable if we're trying to encourage people to take up electricity in a decarbonised economy. And secondly, on the EPC point that you make, you're absolutely right that the measure was designed in the first place to, as a test for fuel poverty, so the calculation is based on the cheapest form of generating uh, energy or for, for your home, so heat primarily. Um, and and if, if that is gas, then you get a lower rating if you're on gas than if you're on uh, using a heat pump. So again, it's a perverse incentive to do, to do the wrong thing. Um, not least, the thing that you just mentioned, that you install a heat pump and your rating goes down. I mean, how can that be? That we, the same applies, if you, put, if you double glaze all the windows in your house, you might be lucky if you get two points. Mm. Whereas in fact, the impact on the, 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 the loss of drafts and you know, so the improvements you make is significant. Uh, and it also is incredibly expensive. It's a thousand pounds a window, roughly. Um, so it, it, there's the, we've got to really look at that uh, again. And I, and I, I think, I hope that this energy efficiency task force can be used as a forcing mechanism to get the various bits of government and and and, and everybody with an interest in this, uh, the community, uh, engaged around changing some of these major structural things to make it work better. Okay, brief point from Gillian, and then I'm going to open up for questions. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on this point about data that Andrew's making. Um, and this isn't an original idea from me. It's, um, I was talking to someone at Microsoft recently about it. The idea that uh, retrofit uh, is only about fabric is wrong. It's about digital, digital retrofit to get that data to drive that performance and, and understanding of use. Brilliant. OK, if you could put your hands up and say where you're from um, and keep the questions short if you can. So I'll take one here, one at the back, and one at the front here. Thank you. Uh, Hugh Lloyd. A long time ago, I was the policy advisor responsible for zero carbon homes and eco-towns. Um, what sort of signals do you think the next government could be sending or should be sending to all parts of the system, whether it's mortgage providers, uh, you know, the, the white man and woman uh, skills and work provider, social housing. Um, there's a lot of things in the 10 point list of the previous government, but actually how and where can we land them to give the signals that people need to do the right thing and keep on with it? Thank okay. you. Good morning, um, Mark Prisk, uh, Chartered Surveyor, now working across the residential sector, but also a former parliamentary colleague of Kerry and Philip as a construction minister and housing minister in the coalition government. Uh, I strongly endorse the need to reform EPCs. I think that's absolutely right. They are inadequate as they stand. And I say that as a homeowner as well as somebody in the industry. But can I ask about the social housing sector? Because I do a lot of work in that field. 
And it's clear that between 10 and 20% of existing housing stock simply are not capable, is not capable of being uh, retrofitted in any viable sense. It's a huge problem for those landlords, the social housing landlords, housing associations and other RPs. Do we need care and flexibility in either the benchmarks, which BRE and others might be enforcing, or indeed in the planning system, so that we understand that, yes, of course, you want most houses that can go in that direction to do so, but not to make it so unviable that actually RPs end up selling the, the very homes because they cannot afford uh, to be able to transfer them to the new standard. That's really interesting. Thank you. And one more question down the front here. Hello, Susan Daish from Jacobs Consulting. Um, just to pick up on Gillian's point, and I think Andrew mentioned also about um, the wider benefits, the wider socioeconomic benefits of addressing poor housing, uh, particularly around health and around um, productivity. But speaking to a number of government departments, they all point back to the frustration at Treasury and that they are uh, hamstrung by the budgets that they are allocated. So how are we addressing actually um, thinking a bit more broadly in terms of monetizing these socio-economic benefits? What does Treasury need to do to um, just revise the way that we are assigning value to some of these benefits that are really seen as a, as a and nice to have as opposed to a, a necessary to take into account. Brilliant. And what was your name, sorry? Susan, Susan. Daish. Susan. All right, I'm, I'm going to go in reverse order. So, Andrew, I'll come to you first. So, uh, we had a question on signals from Stuart on, on sort of signals the next government, uh, whoever that is, um, could be sending to everyone in this system. Then we had Mark on, um, in particular, the really difficult places, uh, social housing and others, and how you might need to flex policy on those. And then that last question from Susan on, on sort of health and, and the way the Treasury scores some of this. Yeah. Um, you pick, pick any of those you like or, or, or all of them. So I think on the signals to the next government, it's uh, for the next government, it's very simply um, direction of travel on this. What's, what's the goal in terms of how many homes are we going to retrofit, hopefully, in, focused on fuel poverty, and what is the, the replacement for boilers? for the decarbonisation and um, a date for phase out of um, boilers and very clear guidance that there is a specific problem around hydrogen for home heating, which is kind of basically delaying any action in this space um, and getting a clear signal on what the government thinks about that and what role it sees it playing is crucially important because there's a lot of people in the industry waiting on that call and, and wanting to know um, if it's going to be a bigger or a small role. Um, I think on the other, if to take the other questions together. It's a really good point, and I'd apply um, the question about social housing to actually a lot of very old um, conservation homes and conservation areas. Uh, someone um, sent me a tweet before this event saying, I've got um, a one centimetre gap in my listed building above the windows, and I can't do anything about it. Um, and it's a really difficult problem. And if there, if there is no fabric solution, I, I don't have an easy answer. I think, I think one possibility, the social housing end, might be to um, accept that the fabric is the way it is and to just focus on letting those people afford heat. You can, you know, there may be a case in those cases for trying to get the most efficient heat source possible. Delia Heat Pump and just saying this is going to cost more, we will help you with the bills and finding a way through. Short of replacing the housing stock in that case, it is really tricky to see where it is. And I do think yeah. if you get, if you make, in the future, in 10 years time, electricity should be very cheap. It should mean, and it should be, there should be a lot more of it. It should be possible to, to plug those kind of gaps. Um, and it's, it's not an ideal answer, but I think we should be relaxed about the idea that sometimes you just need to use a bit more energy to keep that home safe and warm um, as a possibility. And I think on socioeconomic benefits, it's a constant struggle. I think ultimately um, someone needs to sit down and make the business case and pull all of these things in and value them as best they can. <laughs> I'll come to another round of questions in a moment, thanks. Gillian. Uh, yes, well, I, I don't disagree with anything. Um... There, I think um, on the policy um, certainty question, I just want to sort of re-emphasise what I was saying about standards. Um, standards currently not sufficient to get us to our goals. Clearly, we need to have a pathway where people can see where they need to get to. Housing associations, in particular, will be having 30-year strategies and plans. Therefore, let's give them <laughs> something to aim for very specifically. On the, on the point about um, 
the, the houses that Mark was raising, we estimate there are six million homes which, are, which have solid walls uh, and are very difficult to retrofit. And I have to admit, we're the building research establishment, we don't have an answer to that at the moment. We think that there is more research needed on that very, very point. It's a lot of, it's a lot of homes. Um, uh, I suppose I was going to sort of endorse what Andrew was saying about the, the Treasury point. I mean, I've, I've been involved in policy discussions for most of my 30 plus year career. Uh, I've never seen many great examples of joined up government. So while we're sitting here in the Institute for Government, I'm going to make a cheeky request that you, you take this on. I'm sure it's a regular topic in this building. But it is, it is critical. We, we, we can see, as outsiders, we can see these numbers. If you could just apply some of that funding over here, you collectively would save X. And it seems that the, the whole way that government operates is just broken when it comes to this challenge. And if anyone's interested, we've published a big report on net zero, which looks at some of those issues of departments sometimes making uh, policies in conflicting ways. Um, Kerry, interested in your thoughts on, on any of those questions, but particularly perhaps uh, this point from Stuart on, on the signals. One of the things we've also had a question online about the government's sort of communications strategy on this. I know Grant Schatz was sort of out there doing a, a video from his home and sort of talking about the sort of steps he was taking, but I don't know if this is quite cut through in the sort of big yeah. public communications, COVID style, uh, sort of fully <laughs> ambitious way of doing it. But what do you think? I think you've renamed him, <laughs> so, haven't you? So. Sorry, I thought it was Stuart, no? no. <laughs> ah, don't know how I knew that. Hugh will. Hugh will. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I hope, you know, in my introductory remarks, when I sort of said that Labour's committed to this, decade-long programme, we've said how much money we'd commit to it, you know, I think that's a, a good starting point, um, but I think there are other levers that we could use to sort of send that signal that we're, we're absolutely serious about it. I mean, I, I agree with what Andrew had to say, actually, on, on all, all his points, but on the, the hard to retrofit, um, I think we accept that, and that is why, you know, as you work your way through this decade-long programme, you obviously start with the, the, the ones that are less of a challenge and there may be some properties that it's um it's just either not possible or not cost effective and i think the clear as you go out to places where property values are much lower that ratio of how much you're spending on them and i'm already seeing some examples where six figure sums are being spent on properties that aren't worth an awful lot more than that so um you know and that, that that's a question there isn't it as to whether you you go down that path or you know whether you decide to replace housing stock and so on on the you know i wish i had the answer to that i mean there's a million and one examples of where if there was only that joined up work it, you know if you look at say food policy and what people eat and the impact on the health service or you know air pollution then yeah you, you just know that there's so many examples of where um if there was better joined up work in um uh, you'd be able to more easily make the case, but it does tend to be departmental. And um, I think particularly it's a challenge when you're in opposition as well, because at least when you're in government, you've got the cabinet office and you've got um, committees, subcommittees, and you've got civil servants that are talking to each other. But it's, it's certainly something that I'm beginning to realise, you know, with my colleagues that we have a separate departmental team that covers the skills, that's in the education department. Um, we've got people in the business team, we've got people in the treasury team, and then the health team. And it's really important to try to pull that together in opposition, but given that that usually just means the shadow ministers getting together, it's, it's easier said than done um, when you haven't got people you can delegate it to. Mm -hmm. yeah. Philip, I'm interested in your thoughts on the, the difficult to decarbonise homes that have been mentioned, and also perhaps on the role of the treasury in this, mm. because clearly there's a bit of a shift in thinking underway. Sure. Well, just to start, on the machinery government point, I mean, Kerry will remember when you were on our committee, we re the environment doesn't respect administrative boundaries. Mm. So we would regularly have ministers from different departments appearing before us because they all had a little bit of responsibility for the issue that we were looking at. Uh, and I think this is a, you know, as has been said by others, this is a, uh, a problem across government with all sorts of governments. It's not unique problem to the UK. Uh, what I think has happened uh, with our host, actually triggered by our hosting of COP26, 
the, the net zero strategy that was put together to, to establish what our nationally determined contribution was going to be for that conference, which has then been challenged in court and is being refreshed supposedly this month, um, made government departments work together through a cabinet committee structure, uh, which was, you know, it was, had the benefit of, of a very clear purpose, which was to bring every, every part of government together to identify what were we going to offer as a country uh, to, the, to, uh, to that conference. And, and I think I've been pressing Prime Minister on this issue of a machinery of government. How do we maintain that kind of focus without having the objective um, of hosting an interna the biggest international conference we ever, ha ever had? Uh, how are we going to do it to deliver net zero Britain? And, and the Prime Minister's response to me in the Liaison Committee when I asked him that question was, I'm going to chair the Cabinet Committee. It's my responsibility. And I, that's a great answer, but it's very hard to see how he's going to have the time to be able to devote to this, given all the other pressures uh, that are on the Prime Minister. But the structure of having a Cabinet Committee and then more, perhaps more importantly, the Implementation Committee is remaining underneath the Cabinet Subcommittee, mm. which is where all the Director Generals of the Departments get together. And I think there is, that this is one of those issues which absolutely requires cross-government response and requires Treasury buy-in, and they of course are a key member of that committee. So I think it's not a hopeless cause. I think there is a, a prospect of this being made to work, but it does require governments to, you know, the government to act in a way that, generally speaking, it hasn't been very good at doing up to now. Um, on, the, so on the point of, uh, of how do we sort of communicate uh, this and get it to, the, to national attention, I mean, we did a report at the beginning of the year on, uh, on accelerating the transition <coughs> Um, from fossil fuels, in which a large section was on how do we manage energy demand, and I called for a national mobilisation, and it was interpreted as a, as a war effort, and it's kind of, it's, it's a rather snappier way of describing it, but uh, I think that is what is required. We've got to put this issue of decarbonising our buildings into the kind of national effort that, you, that we've put into COVID and these other things. I think that is right. It is that important. Um, and any incoming government needs to be thinking in those terms and, and structure its offer to the people at the next, to, to voters the next election in those terms, in my view. Um, just on Mark's uh, excellent point about social housing, uh, this is the lived experience of housing providers right now. I have a village in my constituency where there is a, uh, a run of six social houses owned by a, uh, a social housing provider uh, and they have decided that they are too expensive to be able to retrofit. They've got established a policy at the board level that we're going to have, you know, 100% of our properties are going to be D and get to C, and they will never get there with these properties. So they've decided to uh, move the tenants out and sell them uh, because it's not, they don't, don't have the funding to it. This is in a small village where it's, they're virtually the only social houses in the village. The consequence of that is that they will be bought by people who will almost certainly pull them down and rebuild. So they will not be local residents of the village. It'll be incomers wanting to retire there. And it, cre it, it reinforces this spiral of our, I, I represent a beautiful rural constituency of Ludlow. If you've not been there, I'd strongly encourage it. Um, but come for a, for a holiday, don't retire there. I mean, you, <laughs> <laughs> we need to have people who live there and keep the place vibrant, and, it's, mm. and that's what yeah. social housing provides. Mm. I think it's a massive problem, mm. uh, and I don't have an easy answer for it, I'm afraid. Uh, can, can I just very quickly, on what Philip said in response to... Um, it, uh, was it Susan? Yeah. Um, that cross-cabinet committee that he was talking about, the Prime Minister chair, that works in terms of trying to bring the net zero goals across all government departments. What we don't really have at the moment is when you would factor in the health benefits or the impact on poverty. And I'm not sure what, do you see what I'm saying? So it's, it's, it's great in terms of the Environmental Audit Committee being able to look at net zero across all those mm. departments. But when you look at the co-benefits of it, it's, there's not really a mechanism to do that at the moment. Mm. OK, uh, we've got five minutes left. I'm just going to try and squeeze in two last questions. There's the man at the back who's had his hand up for a a while, and then this, this person here just who's had her hand up. Sorry, you're, you're going to have to ask your question afterwards in the over sandwiches. Hi, um, <coughs> my name. Really brief. We yeah, my name's Sagar. Um, my question is about operational cost scope three, which is nowhere in the UK or Europe. It's about the scope three, the cost of scope three, and getting all the resources 
which is the lithium and the cobalt and everything which is from Congo, Africa, Nigeria, South America, India, where also there's a huge amount of fossil fuels needs to be burned to extract and deforest these areas. Okay. My question is that if we are really earnestly talking about the fossil fueling, then why is it no one's looked at the operational cost, 90% of which is in the global south, where my lands are being ripped up and we never gave permission for green energy products to violate our human and environmental rights. And on the housing side, the houses we're making is still from concrete. Yeah. It's still from water, energy, bleeding materials. Mm -hmm. But my question is, is where is the real earnest holistic conversation mm -hmm of divesting from fossil fuels, the impact on those countries that make the products from us, if they don't have it, then our products are gonna get inextricably expensive. Okay, thank, thank you. you for that. Uh, and I'll just very briefly take this one uh, at the front, and then, panel, I'll give you 30 seconds each uh, to come back I'll, on I'll be very brief. Uh, Bennett Northcote, um, uh, we've had one reference to insane things that are still happening in the market right now with new builds <laughs> that are happening and flats that are flying up all over the place with gas boilers and things like that. Mm -hmm. We're also seeing the sale of hydrogen-ready boilers mm -hmm. right now mm -hmm. as they're happening. Uh, I'd love to hear from our two political representatives, especially the Labour Party. Are they absolutely committing to not pushing <laughs> hydrogen for home heating? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Philip, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, let's go through emissions and hydrogen. Um, so I've got one bit of uh, hopeful news, I think, on scope three emissions in relation to lithium. Uh, we have in Cornwall, the old China clay deposits are, are in granite in two forms, in the spoil from working the, the, the mines for China clay and in the remaining, uh, China, remaining granite reserves. Uh, there is potentially uh, about a third of our lithium requirement for the next foreseeable future, next couple of decades, available in Cornwall right now, without, in much cases, having to, to re-extract is already there. But you're absolutely right, we've got to start taking scope three emissions into our uh, construction methodologies. Uh, so we, we've done an inquiry on sustainability of the built environment where we said we need to have um, whole uh, building carbon assessments done as part of our assessments when we're looking at uh, construction projects and that will stimulate a lot more reuse of existing buildings, which will limit our extraction of yeah. materials for all new. Um, on uh, eight hydrogen-ready boilers, I'm going to... I think that question was directed mainly at Kerry, so I'm going to let her answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's a chicken in out. <laughs> I think that he's just conceded that they're not going to win the next election, so therefore it's all my problems, isn't it? <laughs> so, yeah. um, I would say on that, I mean, you know, in terms of the technology and that, I'm pretty open-minded. I don't think it's my role to sort of pick. Um, the winners. Hil Hilary Benn is a, a real advocate for hydrogen because that's what they're doing in Leeds and we quite often have conversations of it, about that, Alex Sobel, as, as well. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't rule it out as being part of the mix, but perhaps, um, you know, Alan Whitehead, who's Shadow Energy Minister and the absolute uh, geek on these issues, might have a slightly different view. In terms of the, uh, Philip's right about the, the lithium mine, I'm going down to Cornwall to see that with Darren Jones, the chair of the Business Select Committee, actually um, during the Easter recess, as well as checking out things like geothermal at the um, Eden project. So I think that's important, but I think also battery recycling. We don't have battery recycling in this country, and it's absolutely crucial if we're to minimize our use of um, critical minerals. Um, the other thing, you know, just the general circular economy work, industrial decarbonisation, reducing that embedded carbon across the piece, we, we need to do more work on that. And um, actually with the setting up of the new department, energy security and net zero, industrial decarbonisation seems to have come into that department now. Um, whereas, um, yeah, so it was previously with... Um, uh, I think caught in the mix with all the business um, stuff. So hopefully there'll be more of a focus. Brilliant. Thank you, Jillian. Yeah, just a few quick ones that we're involved in. Circularity uh, in, the, in the construction industry, we do quite a lot of advisory on that. Um, we do demolition audits, for instance, to enable um, uh, developers to understand what they're, what they're dealing with. Um, and, I, and I know that there is a lot of work going on in government, for instance, on more use of sustainable products such as timber. But of course, you, you quickly get into safety when you start talking about those sorts of materials. So a lot, of, a lot more research work is going on into these areas and it must continue. We need to continue to invest in, 
in research uh, on to, to, to achieve this sweet spot between safety and sustainability. Mm. Andrew. Yeah, thanks. I'd just say very simply, climate change is awful and it affects um, countries which are generally much less well off than ours. And we have, as the UK, emitted um, a lot more carbon than most of the countries. So I think we have an absolute duty to get that, our emissions down as quickly as possible. And our, um, our homes throw out around three tonnes on average of carbon every year. That's a huge amount of carbon that you don't necessarily notice. We need to tackle that by whatever means possible, as quickly as possible. Um, but I think the way to do that, there is a matter a question of scale and the sort of quickest way to reduce those emissions and um, with things like concrete and indeed um, some of the other materials that are needed for this, you have to find ways. We have to, we'll have to make zero carbon concrete. That's something that has to happen to get to net yeah. zero. We have to decarbonise everything. But what we need to do is start with the things that are ready to go now, which includes the things we've been talking about today, get that done um, and, and try to move towards a safer climate as quickly as possible, while at the same time um, addressing the really awful fuel poverty that we've talk, rightly talked about an awful lot today. Brilliant. OK, well, that's all we've got time for. Um, apologies to those online who were locked out to start with, but you can go back and watch the first 15 minutes uh, on, uh, online afterwards if you'd like to. I uh, hope you enjoyed the rest of the discussion. Um, for those in the room, there is lunch outside, sandwiches. Please go and uh, help yourselves to those and have a natter. Uh, Quick housekeeping, our next public event, what does the spring budget mean for UK fiscal policy, is this Thursday at 12.45. Uh, and it just remains for me to say thank you again to the Buildings Research Establishment for supporting this event. Thanks very much to you for coming, and thanks to our panel. <laughs>